On September 14, 1976, the American aircraft carrier USS John F. Kennedy was taking part in a NATO naval exercise called Teamwork 76. It was press day, and the Navy was showing off their newest fighter interceptor, the F-14A Tomcat. The ships were 100 miles northwest of the Royal Navy base at Scapa Flow. One of the Tomcat fighters with the Navy squadron VF-32 was lost that day. The plane was taxiing toward catapult number three for what should have been a normal launch when the plane's twin jet engine suddenly roared to full power, even though the throttle was all the way back at idle. The plane began to roll forward, and the pilot, Lieutenant John Kosich, stepped hard on the brakes. The wheels locked up, but the thrust of the Tomcat's twin engines was simply too great. The plane started to skid forward, heading straight toward a line of fully fueled and armed planes. Kosich knew that if he hit the planes, the aircraft carrier's deck would explode into a fiery mess. To avoid catastrophe, he turned hard to the left. Men on the flight deck scrambled out of the way. One broke his ankle but jumped clear. When the Tomcat reached the edge of the carrier's deck, Lieutenant Kosich and his radar intercept officer, Lieutenant J.G. Seymour, were out of options. They fired their ejection seats, the canopy blew off, and they parachuted to safety. As for the Tomcat, it plunged into the sea and sank out of sight. A Soviet Navy cruiser was nearby, watching, keeping a distance but recording and photographing everything. The Soviets hoped to catch a glimpse of some secret American technology, and for them, the plane was a potential intelligence bonanza. It featured the Navy's newest top secret radar system, the ANAWG-9, and under the wing was a long-range AIM-54 Phoenix missile, the most advanced air-to-air -air missile ever designed. If the Soviets could recover the plane, they could reverse engineer the technology. A race was on between the superpowers, and both intended to be the first to recover the plane from the bottom of the sea. The problem was, the ocean was 1,850 feet deep at that point. With its wings out, the Tomcat might have even glided underwater for a mile or two before hitting the seafloor. But in which direction? Recovering the plane wasn't going to be easy. First, the U.S. Navy put up a 24-hour aerial patrol over the site with a detachment of Lockheed P-3 Orion Maritime Patrol aircraft. The Navy assembled a salvage fleet with the help of Seaward Incorporated, a naval special requirements company from Falls Church, Virginia. The operation expanded then to include several NATO partners. Norway sent Constructor, a salvage ship from which the U.S. Navy operated an unmanned radio-controlled submersible that they called Curve 3. The British sent Oil Harrier, a salvage ship with winches that were strong enough to lift the plane. Side-scan sonar systems were brought in from Hydro Surveys, a company in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Finally, the Navy provided one of its Abnaki-class fleet tugs, USS Shakori, to lead the effort. Meanwhile, the Soviets assembled and sent out their own fleet of recovery ships. The main difference between the American and the Soviet efforts was that the Soviet salvage fleet was backed by several warships. Technically, all nations have a right to recover anything lost at sea, and it seemed that the Soviets were willing to defend that right with force. USS Shikori and the Norwegian recovery ship Constructor arrived first. They began running search tracks using sonar in hopes of quickly locating the plane, but late September storms brought massive waves. The ships were rocked, rivets popped, some of the crewmen almost got washed overboard, and after 10 days, the battering delivered in the open seas was such that they had to return to port in Scotland for repairs. Just before setting course for Scotland, on October 3rd, the side-scan sonar showed what looked like a plane-shaped target on the seabed. The location was carefully charted. Using a secure communications channel, the likely position of the Tomcat was radioed back to the Pentagon. Then the two ships set a course for port. They returned a week later. What nobody knew at the time, however, was that the Soviets had acquired the complete plans for the Navy's most secure coding machine, the KY-75 Parkill. As well, the Soviets had copies of the daily, monthly, and fleet-specific codes. This was the work of the Johnny Walker spy ring, which was uncovered nine years later, in 1985. The Soviets had intercepted the message and knew exactly where to look. 
They also knew that the area would be clear of American ships for at least a week. When the two ships returned a week later, the sonar target was simply gone. At first, Navy analysts thought the Soviets had somehow made a midnight run through the area with a fishing trawler. Maybe they'd snatched the plane in a net. Still, that made no sense. It had taken the Americans and Norwegians together two weeks of searching to find it. As well, the Navy was still flying patrols overhead. The Soviets would have had to race through at midnight, knowing somehow exactly where to look, and grab it with a net. None of it made sense. The two ships began another search. All the while, though still some days away, the Soviet salvage fleet was fast approaching. Meanwhile, back in Scotland, an engineer from the Navy contracting company, Sperry, who was named Roger Sherman, was following the recovery efforts closely. He realized that he had an idea that might help, so he walked into the headquarters of Submarine Squadron 2 at Holy Loch, Scotland. He suggested the Navy send its top-secret NR-1 research submarine to try and recover the Comcat. The Navy officers looked at him blankly. They had no idea what he was talking about. The NR-1 was so secret that they had never even heard of it themselves. They called the Pentagon on a secure phone line to ask for authority to deploy the sub immediately. The Navy surface fleet commanders, however, turned down the request on the spot. The Tomcat was suddenly in the middle of a turf war between the surface ship Navy and the submarine Navy. The real clout, as always, rested on the surface side. Not willing to give up, Sherman placed another call. And soon, Admiral Hyman Rickover was asked to weigh in personally. In a classic Rickover move, he steamrolled the surface admirals and got the order reversed. The NR-1's mission was on. A classic Cold War standoff followed, with the Soviet and Allied fleets eyeing one another suspiciously from a distance. From what the Soviets could see, though, on the surface, nothing was happening. What they didn't know was the NR-1 was directly below already performing a box search pattern, looking for the lost Tomcat. Two crew members were peering out of glass windows on the sub's nose as it crept along about 100 feet off the bottom. Every square meter of the area where the Tomcat had been lost was checked. The plane simply wasn't there. Using the sub's sonar, they pinged the surrounding area and got a return from some miles away. They headed over for a look. As they crept forward, suddenly, straight ahead, the way was blocked by a mess of trawler nets waving in the current. The fast action of the helmsman stopped the NR-1 only 20 feet before the sub got tangled in the nets. Cautiously, they backed away, then descended to the seafloor to take a look what the nets were caught on. And sure enough, there was the F-14 Tomcat. It was upside down. One wing was crushed, and ominously, the M-54 missile was missing. The plane had clearly been dragged several miles from where it was first lost. The Soviets must have made a midnight dash through with a fishing trawler. Luckily, the Tomcat was too heavy, but for thicker lines, the Soviets might have scored the biggest intelligence coup of the decade. The NR-1 then attached cables to the plane while preparations were made on the surface for the lift. When all was ready, USS Shikori and Oil Harrier, a UK ship that the Royal Navy had hired, began to winch the plane up. Realizing that the Americans must have the Tomcat, the Soviets took action. One of their warships made a run straight at USS Shikori, trying to disrupt the lift by ramming it. The Royal Navy fleet tanker HMS Blue Rover, however, pressed in between and blocked the way. The Soviets veered off at the last minute and both ships began a dance of masterful maneuvering. As all this was going on, the cables suddenly snapped, and the plane fell back to the seabed. When the Soviets saw that, they backed off. The standoff resumed. When the NR-1 cruised over for a look at the plane, they could see that it had landed this time right side up. With worsening weather and the Soviets nearby, it was clear that another strategy was needed. Taking a cue from the Soviets themselves, the Navy decided to wrap the plane in cables and drag it to shallow Scottish waters. They could lift it from there. And best of all, the Soviets couldn't follow the plane into UK territory. Two West German salvage ships were brought in for the job. The NR-1 then went looking for the missing Phoenix missile. 
By backtracking from the position from where they have found the plane, they found the missile on the seafloor, only slightly damaged. It was small enough that the NR-1 could recover it directly. The submarine featured a keel claw directly on its bottom. It could lower itself to the seafloor, drive forward, and once directly over the missile, the keel claw would be lowered, would grab the missile, and pull it up inside the sub. The problem was, the missile was no longer on the plane's pylon, and as such, it was likely armed. If it exploded, the submarine would be destroyed. Carefully positioning itself overhead, the sub grabbed the missile. Then the sub rose to the surface, and under the cover of darkness, transferred the missile to USS Shikori, where it was defused. A few days later, the German trawlers arrived, and they dragged the plane into Scottish waters. Once the plane was lifted off the seabed, the Navy was able to verify that all the key components were still on board. A short time later, the U.S. Navy issued a press release crediting the recovery of the plane to the NR-1. They simply described it as a five-man research submersible. That was the first the Soviets had heard of the NR-1. The Soviets tried to figure out where it was, what it was doing, and what missions it was performing. To this day, the Russians know of only two. One was this story, the Tomcat that got away, and the other was when the NR-1 found and explored the wreck of the Titanic. You know what? Movies should be made about stories like that. I'm Thomas Van Hare, and this is Historic Wings. If you like these videos, please subscribe and click like. Consider sponsoring us through Patreon and PayPal. And remember, there's always more to the story.